So last week, we briefly went through Revelation, the 13th chapter. But there's some things I think that we should go through again so that we can be clear about the events. Then I stood on the sand of the sea and I saw a beast rising up out of the sea having seven heads and ten horns. And of the ten, uh, of the ten horns, ten crowns on his heads, a, a blasphemous name. And we said that the seven heads for the seven hills of Rome, the seats of government, the ten heads with the ten horns are the leaders of ten governments. And of those ten governments, they will bind together to be the basis for giving this beast, this human being that exercises power as the supreme leader, all his power. Now the beast which I saw was like a leopard, and his feet were like the feet of a, boar, uh, of a bear, and his mouth was like the, that of a lion. And the dragon gave him his power his throne and his authority. Remember Daniel 2 and 7. The descriptions, they are in reverse looking back. And this is exactly what was seen by the prophet Daniel. And in this one being, all the power, cunning, and attributes of those nations that comprised those nations depicted in that period are going to be integral to this being that now, now is literally possessed by Satan himself. Now remember this term antichrist is the idea of a counterfeit Jesus. He is a counterfeit. Look at what's happened here. He comes from being a human being. Jesus had to become a human being. He has grown up in the seat of government. Jesus has promised the seat of government later. His father, Satan, now endues him with all of his power, all of his might, and all of his influence in those countries where he has a stronghold. And under the strongest delusion, greed, under the strongest desire for absolute power, the kings of those nations choose to worship this beast, this antichrist, because of his huge demonic power and everything inside that leadership, everything inside those peoples, it draws them. Just like the Holy Spirit. He goes on. And I saw one of the heads as if it had been mortally wounded. His deadly wound was healed. And all the world marveled and followed the beast. What does Paul say as he speaks of the resurrection? He says, if the resurrection never happened, our Christianity is in vain. And we have believed a lie. Isn't that what he said? No resurrection, no Christianity. No resurrection, no truth in the message of Jesus. This man suffers a mortal wound in his head and is apparently resurrected. He goes on. Then he opened his mouth in blasphemy against God and, and blasphemed his name, his tabernacle, and those that dwell in, in heaven open rebellion against the God of Jacob and of Isaac and of Abraham. All who dwell on the earth will worship him, whose names were not written in the book of life of the Lamb slain before the foundation of the world. Your name was written in before the world was created. So even though some of these people who are left on the earth after the rapture, they'll still be written in the book of life. Stay tuned. I'll explain that. If anyone has an ear, let him hear. God's way of saying, listen up, this is important. Then I saw another beast coming up out of the earth, and he had two horns like a lamb. This is someone 
who speaks soft and slow and has all the right religious things to say. Looks like the lamb has two horns. But when he speaks, everything he says is right out of Satan's mouth. Sound like a religious figure? Careful who you watch on TV. And he exercises all the authority of the first beast in his presence and causes the earth and those who dwell in to worship the beast whose deadly wound was healed in. Now we have three, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, compelling people to the worship of the beast. He performs great signs so that he even makes fire come down from heaven on the earth and in the sight of men, just like the two witnesses. And he deceives those who dwell on the earth by those signs which he has, was granted to do in the sight of the beast, telling those who dwell on the earth to make an image to the beast who was wounded in the, in, by the sword and live. And where does the image go? The Holy of Holies. It's in the temple. He was granted power to give breath to the image and of the beast, that the image of the beast could both speak and cause, and cause as many as would not worship the image of the beast to be killed. Now there are those that believe that that is a computer, or at least computer controlled. It's possible. <clears throat> Could be. But we know that it'll be so animatronically perfect that it will be tied in in some way so it seemingly knows everything about everybody, knows what everybody's doing at every minute of the day, all kinds of that stuff. There's never been a time when it, that's possible like today. Did you see recently in an article, Google had to admit that they have been tracking Everybody with a Google app in their cell phone, whether they wanted it or not, even if you had your tracking function turned off, they have been tracking every place you go. It's possible. It can be done now. He caused all, small and great, rich and poor, free and slave, to receive a mark in their right hand, and in their foreheads. Do you remember our discussion of the front row? And that the mark holding the scrolls in the hand or having in the frontlet and the scripture specifically that was to be contained in the frontlet was a declaration that there was one God and you would love only that God. You would do nothing that spoke against that God. It was your complete and total alliance and reliance upon Yahweh. And here it says in order to buy, sell, take care of your family, hold a job, own a house, be able to sleep indoors in order to get medical care, in order to do everything. The first and foremost thing you have to do is you have to replace the frontlet that exists in your mind and the service that you've been giving to your God in your hand. And you have to say, I reject the Messiah of Almighty God and I now give my life in its entirety to Satan. It's rejecting Jesus and making Satan your God. And if you don't do it, he will star starve you, he will hunt you down, he will murder you, he will make it impossible to travel, he will make it impossible to live. He will take your entire life. And that no one may sell except one who has the mark and the name of the beast and the number of his name. May not buy or sell. Here is wisdom. Let him who has understanding calculate the number of the beast. For it is the number of a man. His number is 666. And you remember we had a very brief discussion about the way the Greek and Hebrew alphabets work. 
and that they don't have numbers by themselves, that each letter is also a number and that various names are divisible by certain numbers. And what's being said here is when that beast is finally revealed, you'll be able to take that same number system, Greek, Hebrew, and when that number is divisible and adds up to 666, you got your guy. That's him. Now, what's happened so far? Terrible things have happened. Things have happened at the hands of the two prophets. We say, why? Why has all of this happened and where does this bring to us? I go back to the lady in the phone call, but before I do, I want to give you the analogy I came up with before that real life analogy came up. You have a child that you love very desperately. And you notice that that child has been very sick. And in holding that child, you happen to feel some place on their body and there's a lump. And your heart sinks in you saying, oh God, what is this? And you go to the oncologist the oncologist spends a few moments with the child, sends the child out with the nurse and says, I need to talk to your mommy and your dad for a minute. The oncologist turns to you with tears in his eyes and says, it's cancer. And the reality is that it's very large and the only real chance is to take a large, sharp scalpel and to deform her and cut it out. And the parents look at each other. Now there are a couple of possible responses to this. If that child were an adult, that child could say, uh, it'll be all right. Look, I just get sick like this sometimes, okay? You guys need to keep quit pushing me over this. In fact, if you keep pushing me over this, I'm just gonna leave. I don't wanna hear about this anymore. I'm doing fine and I'm gonna be all right. Matter of fact, I think your doctor is a quack. I don't think any of this even exists. And so they go on. And as a parent, you got one of a couple of choices. You can look at each other and say, you know what? They're absolutely delusional and they're gonna kill themselves. There have been cases where parents have gone out and have gotten custody orders, temporary custody orders over adult children because they have good medical advice that if they don't get the surgery, they're going to die. Some people would look at that and say, they have a free choice. They have a free choice and what's important is my relationship with that child and you know, if that's what they choose in their life, that's what they choose. And some parents will say, you may hate me for this for the rest of your life, but I will not let this take your life. And I'm going to get that court order and I am going to see you have the surgery that will save you and you can decide later whether you hate me or not. Tough choice, huh? This is what's happening. 14th chapter. What's happening here? God, in the opening of the seventh seals, has shown man for who he is. And he has cried out to man after the church is gone. He's left them every witness on tape. 
He's left them every YouTube video that they don't scrub. He's left them every Bible that people have stashed at Petra. He's left them with family members ringing in their ears that said, listen to me, this is getting serious. I can see the leaves turning on the trees. And they said, you know, you know my aunt's kind of a religious fanatic. It's my grandmother and, oh, you know, that's, that's how they used to believe back then. We just leave them alone. I mean, they're all right. And then you have those who have the same children. And, you know, they, they come to the church club now and again. You know what I mean? That's the one where you get 15-minute sermons. You get a sermonette, and it makes Christianettes. You know, you never hear anything about repentance. You never hear anything about the portions of the Bible that don't tell you how you can get something. You never hear about any of those things. All you hear about are the things that will make you happy and make you feel better about yourself. And when they hear the child has cancer, they say, well, we're just going to love them. As a matter of fact, the neighbor's kid's got cancer too. Maybe it's got something to do with the neighborhood. I know that there's a doctor that can cure this with surgery, but I mean, it's, it's not my business. Matter of fact, uh, at work, they might call it meddling if I went in and told them about the cure. Right now, in this portion of scripture, these people are beginning to wake up and hear that ringing in their ears. Because the very people who come to church and tell each other about how much the love of God is in them won't stand up and tell other people outside, you've got a disease and it's killing you. And if you don't do something about it, it's not just going to take your life, it's going to take your eternity. It's not like they're going to just die and then everything's going to go black. That sister or brother of yours, that cousin, that person you work with, that neighbor across the fence, those who have laughed at you in the past because you've told them the truth. The day is coming. You and I are going to be gone. These things are going to begin to happen and they're going to think back and the people they're going to remember are the people who said, listen to me, I love you. And they said, you're in my face. That's right. I care enough to tell you the truth. You might think it's embarrassing to do that. Yes, it is. It's embarrassing. It's hard. Sometimes people don't want to talk to you anymore when you do that. But friends, if you really care at all, you're the last shot they've got. Because the churches are filled with people that are more concerned with fitting in than they are of just telling the truth. You're sick, friend. You've got fatal illness. You've got sin. I, don't, I only know of one doctor that's got a cure. If you care, speak up. You know how churches grow? It's not from the pastor. Sheep bear sheep. When people get really concerned that other people hear the truth, they refuse to stay silent. And they speak it. I encourage you, speak out. Let them think you're a little crazy. Fourteenth chapter, first verse. 
Then I looked, and behold, a lamb standing on Mount Zion. Where is he at? Mount Zion, Israel. And with him 144,000 having his father's name written on their foreheads. Whose name is in the frontlet on their forehead? Yahweh. These are those that have heard the message that said, you want to buy, you want to sell, you want to have a life? Then you must have the frontlet of the Antichrist. And they have turned and said, if I starve, if I lose my family, if I lose everything that was dear to me, if I can't go to school, if I can't get a job, if people spit at me in the street, I'm going to be found standing on Mount Zion with the name of Almighty God on my forehead. And another something else, the 144,000, who are these people? Do you remember? Jews. Jews. 144,000 Jewish evangelists. Look at what's been happening. God has been allowing a rain of really terrible things to happen in the earth. And he has also sent people who have picked up where their ancestors left off. You say, what do you mean by that? There were promises that were made to Abraham and to the Old Testament prophets that said that the Messiah would come. And when the Messiah came, he would rule and reign in Israel if they would accept him. Do you remember how precisely the scripture predicted the return of Jesus? from the time permission was given for Israel to return to Jerusalem, 483 years to the day. I believe it's Nisan 14. I hope that's right. I know it's the month of Nisan. That was the day when Jesus rode into Jerusalem on the back of a little donkey, a sign of a king. And they threw down palm branches and they declared him to be king. That was his sincere offer to be the fulfillment as the king of Israel. But they didn't want him. They turned their back on him. And they crucified him. And he knew that they would. Now, what happens here? What happens here? is that these are 444,000 Jews that take him up on his promises to Israel. They are messianic servants of the king. They are Jews that say, we declare Jesus our Messiah. They do what Israel didn't. Do you know what Israel's job originally was? Original, the original purpose for Israel was to birth the Messiah and to do one other thing. When the Messiah came, they, they, could, they could have made him king right there on the spot. And they would have become the evangelists to the entire world for the Messiah. The Jews were to be the evangelists. And Gentiles were to hear about Jesus from, from, from the Jews. But they rejected him. They said no. And when they said no, Israel got set aside. Don't believe me? Ask Paul. That's exactly what happened. Now, coming around in full circle, here's 144,000 that would make him king. God had to use non-Jewish evangelists, with the exception of Paul, of course, in order to get the message out. Because the Jews rejected Jesus as king and refused to be the evangelist of the world. All right. And I heard a voice from heaven like the voice of many waters and like the voice of the loud thunder. And I heard the sound of the harpist playing their harps. They sang as it were a new song before the throne, before the four living creatures 
and the elders, and no one could learn that song except the 144,000. Folks, where's the church? It's in heaven. The church has a song. What do they call it? The song of the redeemed, does it not? This is another group of people, and they have a song. We find that there are three specific people groups and three different songs that are going to be sung in eternity. The song of the redeemed, there's going to be the song of the 144,000, hmm? and there's going to be the song so the, that of those that are, the, the, uh, that are uh, saved during this portion of time. You know what God's going to have? He's going to have a symphony. And when the 144,000 sing their song, we'll remain silent, ready to sing the chorus with the angels. When all three groups sing, they sing on their own their praises to God, and then we all join together with the angels for the, for the chorus there. It's going to be a grand symphony everywhere, all declaring their relationship to God and His faithfulness. Can you say amen to that? Man, if that doesn't excite you. Wonderful stuff. These are the sons of those who were not defiled with women. Remember the Nazarite vow? These are those Jews that took seriously the vow. They wanted nothing in their life, nothing in their life that would distract them for being, from being witnesses for Jesus. It wasn't that there was anything wrong with marriage. They realized they were in perilous times and their lives were at stake. And they wished to have no encumbrance, only Jesus. Uh, and these were the sons who were not defiled with women, for they are virgins. These are the, are the ones who will follow the Lamb wherever he goes. These were redeemed among, from among men being first fruits of God and to the Lamb. And in their mouths was found no deceit, for they are without fault before the throne of God. Now I saw another angel flying in the midst of heaven, having the everlasting gospel to preach to those who dwell in the earth, to every nation, tribe, tongue, and people, saying with a loud voice, Fear God and give God, give glory to him. For the hour of his judgment has come and worship him who made heaven and earth, the sea and, the, and springs of water. Let me give you a picture of what's happening here. Christians throughout the time of church history have cried out many in earnestness to a world that laughed at us and said, take it seriously, he's coming, there's a heaven to gain and hell is hot. And there are those who have tried to silence those of us who tell that second part of the message as well as the first, hell's hot and you don't wanna go there. They say it's socially un unacceptable. And when the church is gone, the two prophets, Stand in front of Israel. The focus of all things turning back toward the Jewish people. And they plead and they cry and they do miracles in front of the people. And they say, come home to Yahweh. He's pleading, he's crying as these plagues, as these terrible things are happening. God has the lapels of Israel shaking them, saying, you've got to come home. It's almost over. And the two prophets, when their message is done, are killed. And 144,000 Jewish evangelists who cared nothing for their life or their own personal pleasure, even the semblance of a normal, orderly family life. And they preach to all of Israel and to every Gentile who are here. And they're pleading and they're crying as two-thirds of humanity is being wiped out. Two things are happening simultaneously. 
the mercy of God is shaking as hard as he can to redeem the remnants of those who have turned their heart against God. And he's refusing to let go until the last second. And he's shaking them so hard that people today would call him cruel. There is a loud cry across the land saying, except Jesus come home amidst the rumble of thunder, lightning, shaking earth and massive death. You know, God's doing two things. He's exercising his last ditch attempt at mercy. It's like the surgeon's knife. And at the same time, he knows there are those who have set their way they have bought into Satan. And what he does is he recognizes that now is the time I have to put in the sickle and I have to reap that crop and put it in the wine press and press it out. There are those who will not turn. You might say, I don't believe God would do that. Really? And I would suggest that you ought to get back in your Old Testament and get back to the book of Joshua. I seem to remember a young man standing on the edge of a river, having watched the nation's leader and redeemer, Moses, die. And when God told him, he gave him instruction. He said, when you go into this land, you kill everybody you come to because they will not turn they are inflicted with a disease for which they have no yearning for a cure. They have turned their entire life to the worship of the Baals, Ashtaroth, and they have made it the firm commitment. That's what's on their forehead <coughs> and the works of their hands. And you can't change it, son. They've got to go. Because if you don't, It'll infect Israel, and you'll pay for it later. In the remainder of these chapters, through the 19th, or 19th chapter, God's cleaning the house. He's shaking those who might hear him hard because he wants them saved. And he knows those who won't turn. And he is slaughtering those who have made the commitment to Antichrist. He's getting the world ready for a millennial reign. That's what the rest of this is about. And another angel hollowed, hollowed followed saying Babylon is fallen and when we get to the 17th chapter I'll go into this in some detail okay so just take it that Babylon is two different things it's an economic system and it's a religious system and let it go at that till we get to the 17th and another angel followed saying Babylon is fallen is fallen the great city because she has made all nations drink the wine of the wrath of her fornication. Then a third angel followed them saying with a loud voice, if anyone worships the beast in his image and receives his mark in his forehead uh, or on his hand, he himself shall also drink of the wine of the wrath of God with, uh, with it, which is poured out full strength into the cup of his indignation. He shall be tormented with fire and brimstone in the presence of the holy angels, in the presence of the Lamb. And the smoke of their torment ascends forever and ever, and they have no rest day or night who worship the beast and his image and who receives the mark and his name. Get the gist, 
God is shaking the earth as hard as he can to get people to turn because he knows there's no way back. He's not desirous that any should perish. But when people have made that commitment to Satan, it's over for them. Then I looked and behold, a cloud, white cloud. And on the